to this evening's strategic farm event um, on tame lambs, profit or loss. My name's Leah Shanks. I'm AHDB's Knowledge Exchange Manager for Beef and Lamb in the Southwest. And this evening I'm joined by my colleague, David Pett, who is um, Benchmarking Knowledge Exchange Manager down in Cornwall, strategic farmer, Adrian Coombe from Cornwall, and my colleague, Emma Steele, who's going to help us with tech and be the question master for this evening. So before we get into to the, the juicy stuff, we'll start with um, just a bit more, if I can click on my slide. There we go. Okay, so a bit more um, uh, advice for you guys on how to ask a question. So um, I'm sure you're all old hands at this now, but if you're not, um, there's a little orange arrow that will have appeared on your screen. Click on that orange arrow to enlarge uh, the toolbar. You'll see um, a variety of options on there, one being questions. If you enlarge the question box, you should see um, uh, an option to type your question here. So at any point within the evening, if you've got a question, please type it in there and then click send. That will go through to Emma and she'll pop up and be able to ask questions on your behalf. Um, if you want to say hello to Emma, please do that now and then you can trial it. Um, but what we will do is we'll start off with a bit of a poll. Oh, we'll go for an agenda first. So the agenda this evening is um, a bit of an introduction on Dupath Farm. We're then going to look at the tame lamb husbandry and management practices, followed by tame lamb costings. So Emma, if I just stop sharing my screen, and then if you could launch that poll for me, please. So you should have the um, poll in front of you now. And the question is, do you rear pet tame or cade lambs, whatever you want to call them? And please select one of the below answers, which is yes, I have done for years. Yes, but I'm relatively new to it. No, I'm not yet, but I'm thinking about it. And no, I don't plan to. So we'll just leave that poll open for a minute. Can you see the answers coming in, Emma? Yep, yeah, we've got about 73% have voted. Oh, wow, okay. We're at about 80%. Do you want me to close it, Leah? Yeah, go for it. So the webinar result, um, the webinar results, the poll results then are, do you rear your pet lambs? 72% um, have done and have done for years. 7% um, do, but they're relatively new to it. 14% um, don't yet, but they're thinking about it. And 7% don't, and they don't plan to. Interesting. It's good to know a little bit more about our audience. So Emma, if you can stop sharing that, and then I'll start sharing my screen again. Right, so that should be back up now. So, without further ado, let's make a start. So, Adrian, over to you now. So, Adrian Coombe is our strategic farmer for beef and lamb down in Cornwall, um, and he farms alongside his lovely wife Lynn and his dad Peter. So, we'll just do a bit of an overview first, Adrian. So, um, in your own words, tell us a bit about the farm. Right, uh, good evening everybody. Um, the farm is very much a mixed farm with uh, obviously grass, cereals, a few potatoes. Um, the cattle were all sort of dairy bred. Um, the heifers and steers that we take from sort of sturts right through to the fat. Uh, they go mainly through key pack. And then next slide. Uh, the ewes, they're all North Country mules from a single farm in Skipton. We've been buying there for the last probably seven or eight years. So all the pretty much all the sheep on the farm are from the one source. Uh, the rams, there's a real big mixture of rams on the farm because uh, we're a ram compare farm, which we're going to come on to later on, I think. So as you can see, there's what's it, one, two, three, six different breeds we used last year. Um, we're lamb all indoors. We due to start lambing in about two days time, I think. Uh, they all pretty much go to Dunbeer in Wales, again, because of the Round Compare project. Labour, I'm the only full-time on the farm, and 
Um, my dad's part-time, so it's my wife, and I've got two part-time employees as well. Uh, we also have um, a few um, diversifications. We sell Christmas trees, obviously, in December. Uh, we have a biobass boiler and a farm shop, a very well, a small traditional farm shop. Brilliant, thank you. You um, you mentioned Ram Compare, so let's cover that now. So for anyone that's never heard of Ram Compare before, what what how would you describe that to them, Adrian? Uh, Ram Compare is a joint project funded by HDB, QMS Scotland, and HCC in Wales. And there's nine farms that have been involved in. Well, I've been part of phase two, which has been the last three years, and we basically have um, EBV recorded rams on farm to mainly test how well the EVVs are or how good the EVVs are and you know do they actually work and I mean through this project they've generated quite a few new EVVs um, and re sort of rescored them as well slightly to you know to actually work in the real real life situation good thank you so um, it's not just strategic farms that's keeping you busy. It's also RAM Compare, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of your strategic farm project, you've got some key focus areas that you identified when you applied. So the first one was to continue benchmarking to inform business decisions, which you've been doing for a couple of years with HDB's farm bench, which we'll touch a bit more on later. Um, you want to improve your grassland management and utilization, improve the quality of your grazing, set up a rotational grazing system for your cattle, and then improve the management of your ewe lambs to regain, regain condition after lambing. But tonight, we're gonna to talk about tame lambs, aren't we? Yeah. So, um, t tell, me about your, tell me about your sheep flock to start with. Let's, let me stop sharing the screen and we'll, we'll talk about that. Right, um, we're obviously all North Country mules. Uh, we, a uh, single sire mate, all the main flock in groups of 50 to 100. Um, up to, well, the last three years we've actually AI'd sheep as well for the Ram Compare project. This year it's, uh, we sponged 150 to come in for the first few days of lambing. Um, there, we don't turn anything more than a double out with a with a ewe, and with the ewe lambs we only turn a single out. Uh, so for, for about nine months of the year, you've kind of got two flocks, haven't you? Because you've got your breeding flock and then your ewe lambs in a separate flock, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, they're pretty much kept separate for 12, well, up to weaning, basically. And at that point, they all get lumped in together. So, yeah, you know, from buying in September right through to sort of uh, June, they're all kept separate. And um, I guess it, it may be a bit of a controversial topic anyway, but why don't you breed your own replacements? Why do you buy in? Uh, it's time and it's it's another thing I've got to look at to attention to detail and I you know I really like the mules and they you know they land well and they're good mothers and it just fits our system really it's we've got fingers in a lot of pies and to try and do something else again on top would you know might break the camel's back as they say <laughs> yeah fair enough you've been doing it for a few years now as well haven't you so um yeah. it's working for you isn't it yeah Okay, so um, you said you're about to start lambing in a couple of days. Is that the breeding flock or the ewe lambs? It's the breeding flock. The ewe lambs start in uh, about three, four weeks' time. Okay. That's what we always do. Yeah, and what were your scanning percentages this year? Uh, the main flock scanned at 187%, which was you know, roughly about where I wanted it to be. And we had 25 empties out of the 500, which was a little few, few more than I wanted to would prefer but that's um comes back to one of my uh, strategic farm um aims is to try and get the ewe lambs back into lamb the second year round but uh, so 15 of those empties were tutors so that's one of the things we're working on and the ewe lambs this year scanned at 63 percent we it's a lot lower than i wanted uh we slipped up i think i missed one of the wormings sort of month after they came down and knocked their condition and that's just had a knock-on effect with the scanning so something we we're trying to rectify you know the ones in lamb are a little bit poorer than i would like but we're we're working hard to rectify that ready for lambing and why do you breed or choose to breed your ewe lambs uh basically if we don't 
we, we're not worried if they do lamb or not, really, but it's a case of if we get a lamb out of them, it does mean you've got an income for that sheep being on farm for 12 months. So it's, and I mean, looking at my data that I've got recorded on my system, you do get more lambs out of that sheep in its lifetime. So, yeah, you know, it is a bonus to that way as well. Yeah, fair enough. That makes sense. Um, so the topic tonight is tame lambs and tame lambs come about maybe having a bit of a surplus. Why why do you have tame lambs on your farm? Uh, we usually have about 80 or 90 triplets and that's, you know, in a normal year. And we take a single lamb off that triplet, regardless of if she's a really fit ewe. Um, we also take lambs off thinnest doubles if we don't think she can rear too effectively. Uh, when we get to the ewe lambs, we only turn them out for with a single the most. So it's all about thinking about next year's lambing as well. They're trying to give that sheep every chance to regain condition and to be fit enough to you know, breed effectively next year. Yeah, okay. So can you please describe for us your current lambing protocol? So take us through, um, you've got the breeding flock, they're in the shed now, aren't they? Yep. Yeah, okay, so one starts lambing, um, then what? Um, as soon as it's lambed, it goes into an individual pen. Um, obviously, iodined, uh, or navels are iodined with a surgical spirit mix to you know, help aid it dry up the navel to dry up, dry up quickly. Uh, if we remember, we try and go around a second time a few hours later just to make sure they are dry. Uh, if they land before five o'clock in the evening, we aim to try to get them out of the shed the next morning. Um, before they're turned out, the lambs are weighed, uh, tagged, they're ringed, um, and all the data is recorded for them as well. How do you how how do you weigh them at birth? Um, I've got a suitcase weigher, and I've got a bit of rope, a, a lambing rope, a leg rope that I hook around the suitcase weigher and just hold them up like that, basically quickly and then it's all recorded on the Shearwell hand, handheld system. Okay, brilliant. Well, um, so if that ewe has lambed before five o'clock, the next day you plan to turn the ewe out with her lamb yep. or lambs. Um, does she go out and then that's it, she's out or does she come back in? Uh, she will come back into, they go into a little nursery field beyond the lambing shed and they come into a group shed the next night and quite often they'll come in for a second night as well before being turned away. And then hopefully they just stay out then, unless there's you know really bad weather forecast. Okay, and that that works well for you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, very well. Yeah. Okay, um, and what about your colostrum practices? What do you do there? Um, we we well, we hope that the ewes all got good colostrum because we try and feed them the best diet possible. Uh, we do check that the lambs are sucked. If something is short of colostrum, we will see if we can find a single with spare milk and we've got a, um, oh, what's it called? Um, You're utterly easy. That's it, an utterly easy, which is a hand milking machine. So we can you know, borrow a bit off another sheep and feed the lamb. That or we use a replacement colostrum out of a pot. So just to make sure they've got enough. Okay. Um, if you, If you've got a bit too much colostrum or do you ever have that problem? Do you ever freeze any, store any for later? We keep thinking about it, but never think about it at the right time. And it's it'd probably be the right thing to do, but it's it's also when you want a bit of colostrum to feed the lamb, it's time you go to the house, to the freezer and get it and bring it back out. It's sort of, it's easier to go to a pot, to be fair, for honest, or just borrow some off another sheep. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I think um, if you can, if you do freeze it, that's great, but you've also got to remember to defrost it properly so that you yeah, don't do any proteins and stuff as well. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the iodine and the surgical spirit solution that you use yeah. on the navels. Do you use that anywhere else? Uh, yeah, we use it on ear tags because obviously we're tagging at sort of 16 to 24 hours old, uh, so we can follow that lamb all the way through its lifetime. So yeah, we dip my well, we spray iodine on onto that ear tag before it goes through the ear. Okay, okay. Um, and let's talk about then. So those lambs that have been that you've taken off the ewes um, and they're now your tame lambs, what happens to them? So when do they get removed? How long are they with the ewe for? Uh, they're with the ewe for at least 24 hours, so they make sure they've got colostrum and you know 
fit and strong. We take away the lamb that basically we try to leave a pair of lambs with the, with the ewe, you know, the two most even lambs. So they've got equal chance of getting to the milk. And so we take away the, the odd one out as such. That or else if there's three even lambs, we take the one nearest to the gate when we, we walk past. Yeah. So, um, and where yeah. do they go? They go into a little training pen. Um, and we sort of, we try and keep an older lamb in there that's sucking. So he sort of gives the other lambs an idea and they'll stay in that training pen for probably anywhere between 24 and 36 hours or 48 hours, sorry, till they're sucking well. We've seen them sucking two or three times by themselves. Then they go into a larger pen with everything else, all the rest of the lambs. Okay. Um, Emma's popped up, so I think that means she's got a question. So go for it, Emma. Yeah, I've got a couple. So the first one is, does Adrian have any mismothering from ewes and lambs being turned out of the pen quite soon after lambing? Don't have any problem with that at all. I mean, it's nothing we've, we don't see any mismothering at that age. Okay, and the second, it's not really a question, it's a comment, but it's from your vet, Adrian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she said she doesn't know whether it's worth mentioning that this year you'll be checking two to seven day old lambs for colostrum transfer in a few weeks time. Um, and she's been getting some varied results. All right, I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good we've got Miranda here. But <laughs> yeah. um, and then another couple of questions just come in. Um, do you have an automatic milk feeder, Adrian? And if so, which one? Yes, I do. It's the Volac one, uh, the computerized one. And yeah, you know, I swear by it. Yeah, you know, really good, good bit of kit. A lot of money, but it works well. And how many lambs run together in your large pen um, for your for your tame lambs? Um, it's probably up to about sixty or seventy at the, at the peak. But we, um, there's lambs going in daily, and when we get get to thirty five days old, we start weaning daily as well. So there's quite a quick turnaround. Um, and I've got one just snuck in there before I'll go away and let Leah carry on. Um, but do you get joint till? And if so, what's your treatment? We have very very small amount of joint till, even though we're tagging everything at birth, um, and it's usually an antibiotic. You know, prescribed by the vet so it changes occasionally what we get prescribed brilliant and then bridget that you work with um with ram complex ram compare is just flagging that there's a good article recently in the farmers weekly read the verlax system yeah. <laughs> so i'll go away at that point yeah. <laughs> i think that comment on joint ill i think dipping the ear tags beforehand i'm not sure if it's been proven but dipping them in the surgical spirit and iodine is a way to help um, promote hygiene, I guess, and minimise yeah. any potential infection, because it is a, a route of infection, isn't it? Yeah, well, any, any, any sort of break of the skin is a root, root of infection. It is, isn't it? Yeah. So um, can you can you see my slide again now? You can, yeah. can't you? Yeah, I can. Right, so that's that's a, a picture of your, your use in their pens. Yep. Yep, and then I would like to just talk a little bit more about um, weaning. So, yeah, I mean, before you move, before you move on, I mean, yeah. you'll see in the picture there's white boards on all the pens, and on those we write down the time and day of birth. Uh, we also record lambing ease, which is part of the round compare project. So we work on a one to five scales, with one being natural, two we helped it out just because we were there and yeah, you know, convenience. Uh, three was a difficult, um, and then all the way up to five when it's a cesarean. So and do you record? Do you record that on your sheer well handheld? Yeah, yeah that's all recorded, yeah. So you'll it know also this. Mean, it also means that if there's, um, like, we sort of split shift the lambing. So if someone else, if I get there first thing in the morning, I can see on the pens what's got problems or, you know, if anything can't be tagged and put out. You know, I know that's a problem when dad's been there overnight doing stuff. Yeah. And then you'll know for the following year if she's, had mastitis the previous year you'll you'll be able to look back at the oh, yeah. records wouldn't you yeah. yeah um and okay whilst we're looking at the pens then um what so you've got fresh water in there um yeah. you've obviously lined them with straw is there anything else to note in there uh we clean out the pens between every sheep uh the pens lined uh left to dry if if there's time 
you know, depending on how busy we are. Um, yeah, fresh straw. We feed clamp silage to everything. Uh, we try and I try and work it that the the cattle get anything that's got any mold or spoilage on it, and then the sheep get the best. Um, okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so you've mentioned weaning briefly already. So yeah. you every lamb is weighed at birth, so you know their yep. birth weight, and then you said you you wean them at thirty five days. Was that right? Yeah, thirty five days old. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. We, yeah, it's basically uh, we we feed lamb lack, and on the bag it says minimum thirty five days old and a minimum of two and a half times birth weight. We, yeah, we stick to the thirty five days, and we're seeing anywhere between three and four times birth weight on the system. Okay, so um, before weaning them, you'll double check both of those their date of birth and also their weight, and make yeah, sure we. That's at about 10 days old, well, every week or so, we'll go through the lambs and we actually write the date they're weaned, meant to be weaned on on the backs. So then we can easily see, I mean, you can quite, it's fairly obvious usually because of the size of the lambs, but it also just gives you a quick reference so you can pick them out every day when we're weaning. That's a good tip, yeah. So this, this image here, these are your weaned lambs, aren't they? Yes, they are, yeah. Yeah, and then this one is another picture of your weaned lambs. Yeah, I mean, this is from two or three years ago where we were, I think I was weaning weekly at that point, so the green mark meant there was that week's ones to wean. I think there's blue yeah. marks elsewhere and things like that, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Um, Emma, are there any more questions on that before we move on? Yep, so I did have one, but I've now got a couple more come through. Um, so, Adrian, do you feed the ewes with lambs after turnout? No, nope, they go out onto grass, they're rotationally grazed as soon as I can get them going. I mean, they start off in groups of 50 to 100 rotational grazing, then we gradually mob them up to the point where all, all 500 sheep and lamb, with all their lambs are in one single group. Okay. And then referring to your um, pet lambs, I think, the question is, do you cut down your feed or withdraw milk straight away? It's straight away. I mean, it's it's weaned. We usually go in there after we finish doing the lambs, you know, tagging and recording the lambs. We go in, just weigh, weigh what we need to and wean them straight, up, straight off the machine. Okay. And what are your weaned lambs fed? They're on a start to finish pellet to start off with. Um, and I mean, two years ago, they moved on to rolled barley and a protein pellet, which I'll probably do again. Last year I didn't because I didn't have enough barley left. Okay. And just the last one for now then, um, easy one, I think. What milk do you use? Uh, it's lamb lack. <laughs> I have toyed with other brands, but it works very well and you, you always sort of stick with what you know sometimes, don't you? <laughs> And I've had a sneaky one just come in on the back. Um, at what age do you start feeding your starter pellets? It's available from as soon as they move into the main pen at about a day old or two days old. And it's in a little container which I try and clean out at least every other day just to put fresh in there so it's nice, nice room. Okay. Leah, I've got some more questions coming through. Do you want me to carry on or do you want to continue and we'll come back to them? No, that's okay. You can carry on. Okay, so is your milk warm that you're feeding? Yeah, it's all at, I think it's about 37 degrees, I think. And it stays at that temperature all the way through. We don't reduce it because there's a mixed age of lambs in that pen at all times. So it's very hard to start playing with temperatures. Okay, and then... Um... Are your pet lambs kept inside all the time or do they have access um, outside to grass at all? They're kept in all the time. We we have in the past let them out and we probably haven't looked after them quite as well as they would have been if they're indoors. So um, we've had lameness problems with them as well. So we've, three years ago we chose to keep them indoors and it's worked so well that we've that's what we're continuing to do. Brilliant, thank you. I'll go away again. <laughs> we'll talk a bit more about that later as well, the, the comparison between your tame lambs indoors and then your sort of naturally reared lambs outdoors. Um, so are there not any alternatives for you 
for your tame lambs? Could you not sell them on, or would you not think about why can't you foster them onto your breeding flock? What, why, why do you do it the way you do it? Um, when you start with fostering, uh, the average weight of my triplets is um, about 3.7 kilos, and the average weight of my singles is about 5.8 kilos. So there's a very big difference in in weight and I mean, you could say put a lamb on this you know a week old but then they've trained on the machine and it's very hard to train them back to a sheep so it's it just works and, and the machine's there and it, it sort of makes a decision for you it's so easy to do yeah, uh, okay. with the another option is selling them um, but then I mean, the market's sort of 15 20 miles away time I take them there and they've tagged them I've spent you know time getting them going as well they might only be worth 10 15 pounds and that's sort of then you know you've lost that in your time and your effort and the milk powder you put into them already so in some ways you you're not actually gaining anything by selling them yeah fair enough okay um so <laughs> You, I know you know this already, but tame lambs for you, profit or loss? Profit. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> so the, the fact that you know that you can make a profit of your tame lambs, do you think that makes you value them more as an enterprise compared to if you just broke even on them? Um, I think even if I broke even on it, it's, it's the unseen bonuses to the flock. You know, I'm not not drawing that triplet U down during the, you know, when she's milking so much and it's some knock on benefits in the next lambing season, you know, so it's, I can nearly argue that, you know, if I made a slight loss on the tame lambs, there'd still be a benefit to me. You know, it might be a bit controversial saying that, but it's, that's the way I sort of nearly look at it, that, you know, if I could break even, brilliant. But if I make a profit, even better. Fair enough. Good. Thank you. So I think that's going to be a nice introduction into our sort of next segment. So I'm going to bring David Pett in now and show some more slides. So, um, right, we'll go back just one more. Okay. So, um, David, let's introduce you properly. So you you live down in Cornwall, but you work for AHDB in the farm economics team and you're a knowledge exchange manager. What does that mean? Tell us a bit more about your job. Yeah, thanks, Leah. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, my I'm responsible for the whole of the southwest, so the same area that Leah works in. Uh, and I work in farm and economics, and chiefly my responsibilities is, is using the farm bench uh, benchmarking tool with farmers and with farmer groups. Uh, but we we cover cross sector as well. So I'm working with cereals, no seeds, potatoes, beef and lamb, and some dairy as well. Uh, so that's uh, formulating groups, helping people through the process. Uh, and now we're bringing on um, KPI Express onto uh, on stream as well um, right now. So lots of uh, lots of tools on on um, in our toolbox that we can offer farmers from AHDB to, uh, to help look at cost of production and we're very keen on looking at cost of production to see see where, where farmers are, where their strengths and weaknesses are, and um, often working with farmers in groups, it's where we can see uh, farmers helping each other, um, yeah, sensing each other's strengths and weaknesses, and learning from each other as well as as well as the expertise we can uh, we can draw in from elsewhere. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Emma, I'm going to ask you to launch the second poll now, please, um, for the audience. And if you could just read that out for us again. OK, so that should be live. And it is what would you associate with being the biggest cost when artificially rearing lambs? And please select one of them. Is it milk powder, creep or concentrate feed, vet and med um, or labour and your time? Leah, while that's just running, can I just ask Adrian another question? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, Adrian, what's the procedure for lambs that have been outside on a ewe which have had to come in as pets because the ewes died, for example? Uh, they normally go in the training pen again. Um, we sometimes take a little bit longer, although uh, there was an instance two or three years ago where my dad brought one in from field, chucked it in the main pen, he marked it, told me, 
I thought he went and fed it. He thought I went and fed it. And we, we said about it four or five days later and the lamb was there sucking by himself. So surprising how well he actually learned to drink. Okay. And why do you think turning your pet lambs out doesn't work? It's with us, there's so many other things going on. It's remembering to go and, you know, creep them. Um, we you know, usually find that they're stuck in a, a little field which isn't that close to the farmyard and it's remembering to take creep there every day. You get there and think, oh, they need, need creep and you're too busy trying to get onto other things that they sort of get slightly neglected. When they're in the shed, you, the first thing in the morning you walk in there, sort them out, away again. Okay, Leah, we've had 88% vote on that. Would you like me to share the results? Yes, go for it, please. So, um, biggest costs associated with pet lambs, 70% think it's milk powder, 16% think it's creep or concentrate feeds, um, nobody thinks it's vet and med, and 14% think it's labour or your time. Brilliant, thank you. And um, it's probably wise to say there's no right answer here. I think the cost will be different for, for everyone. Um, but tonight we're going to drill down into Adrian's costs and look at those a bit further. So you can close that now, Emma. Thank you. Um, and David, we'll kick off with um, the first slide. Yeah, before we look at this slide in depth, uh, so you can come back out a bit for a moment. I was just going to ask before people look at it. Um, yeah, these figures which you're about to look at, you, know, you you gave them to us, didn't you, Adrian? So these are your figures, and you've already said that you've indicated that you do a lot of recording on your farm, um, which is which is fantastic, and you also do farm bench with us. Um, so could you just give us a rundown of how you arrived at the figures? Uh, most of the figures are, yeah, you know, like the creep and the milk powder is you know, well paid for it. Uh, Vet and med is also what I've used. Depreciation is um, the cost of the milk machine and also the creep feeders I got. And I've spread the cost of those over 10 years over the lambs I've reared each year. Um, and the labour, the labour is about the only grey one that I've made an approximation, but I've tried to be over generous with the time I spent with them to make okay, sure it's a good. fair, fair comparison. So what we'll do with Adrian's figures, is Leah, if you'd like to go forward that slide. Um, yeah, Adrian shared these figures with us very generously a few weeks ago, and um, I've produced this this um, uh, set of figures here from them. Uh, and we're going to show this in graphical form as well to break it down a bit more so you're not looking at a, at a sea of figures in case you've got a, a small screen you're looking at. Um, so. Yeah, so the bottom line, let's sort of cut down to the bottom line where the cost per lamb is. So on the three years, 55, 50 pounds and uh, 69.35. And you've, you've also given us um, your average price that you received. Um, that was a question I meant to ask, Adrian, is that before or after commissions, those figures you've given us? I'm pretty sure they're just after, com they're before commissions. I okay. think. I, I can't. I'm pretty sure that's right. Okay. There is sorry. a couple of quid more to come off that. We might have to allow for that. Okay, just to be clear, because uh, we haven't got that listed. Um, so you see, every year, yeah, there's apart from the last year, and we'll come back to that, um, obviously, because that's that's quite obvious. So you made, yeah, according to your figures, you've made, uh, yeah, quite a good, quite a good, uh, quite a good margin there. Yeah. Okay. Interestingly enough. Um, those of you who take Farmers Weekly, there was an article in this week, last week's Farmers Weekly, some Harper Adams work. We haven't had a chance to speak to them, but their figures came back at £50.62. Now, they've, they've costed theirs slightly different than yours, but uh, that's interesting that yours comes out, you know, on, on the two years, pretty much the same as theirs does. Well, yeah, you know, it's always nice that someone else is doing some work similar to this, and it actually nearly validates what I've costed out. You know, it's not figures are plugged out of the sky. Yeah, okay. So, um, but yes, just let's go from the top. Uh, number of lambs reared, so there's 108. So these are the actual lambs that you actually ended up selling for each yep. year's uh, cohort. 
yeah. uh, as, as described, your, your triplet lambs and, and the double lambs from the ewe lambs and, and, and so forth. So why was there a sudden drop in 2020 to fewer lambs or what happened? Uh, basically, I had pneumonia come into the shed uh, in the tame lambs and I lost quite a few while when they were probably three, four weeks old. And then we lost a number again after they were weaned. This just probably a week after they were weaned, the stress, I think, made the pneumonia come back again. And we lost a few there again. So that's, mm -hmm. and that's sort of had a knock-on effect with a lot of the, the costings down through, as you'll see in a minute. Okay, so was there a specific reason why that happened? Did you keep your eye, get your eye off the ball or something? Or yeah, that was basically it. Um, with lockdown, we got, as I said before, we got a small farm shop on the farm, and we sell potatoes. And during lockdown, for the first two, I think it was two weeks, we were grading potatoes or lamb and sheep, and things like cleaning the tame lamb pen out sort of slid basically. So we try and clean the the main pen out every every week and the training pens every every other day usually at the, at the, at the least you know sometimes it's every day turn on only lambs isn't it and that yeah got pushed the main pen got pushed back to two weeks and yeah just they yeah, have a fresh straw every day but just getting rid of that build up of infection underneath didn't, just didn't happen so what was the weather like then when, when when that was happening it was quite warm as well quite warm as you know still so it was in perfect conditions for for breeding bacteria i suppose yeah so that was that was unfortunate so yeah yeah it, lessons learned for this year don't do that again <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean it's it, you know it proved the point that we've got to clean them out regularly come what may really you know it's it's not a big amount of time spent but it's when you've got other pressures sometimes it's easier to say oh we'll leave that for a few days and then that few days all of a sudden comes a week so it's it's make you know we usually try and do it every friday and that is our routine but back then it just it was impossible to do um, have you got some questions questions coming in yeah we've just got a few um coming through about how you market the lambs adrian so um do you keep them in a shed until market? I think you've said the answer to that is is yes. But yep. what is the time frame um, from 35 days to market? Um, I think we'll be coming on to that. But I mean, we start picking on all the lambs at about 10 to 12 weeks old. And usually within that first pick, there is tame lambs going you know, the, and all the way through. But we've got the average uh, days of slaughter coming up later on, I think, David, haven't we? Yes. Okay. And do you think it'd be more profitable to sell as weak old lambs rather than rearing them? Probably not. Time you've taken taken account the cost you've put to them already. You know the labour, you know, and just the milk and getting them going, and also taking them away somewhere to sell them. And time you take commission out as well. So there's lots of bits that get chipped away at that. Bit you get back from the market. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, which yeah segues into a question I wanted to ask before we move into the uh, uh, to the graphical bit is uh, one thing I've noticed that we haven't included here. Here you haven't included in your your costings is a a purchase cost for that for the lambs. So we're we're coming in at zero cost for the lamb. Um, when obviously there is a cost to produce the lamb, uh, is there any reason why you hadn't thought that thought, thought about that? Well, it comes back to selling them at a week old. You know that the time and effort you put into them to get them to a week old comes back to zero. Time you know when you try and sell them because of the extra cost. So you sort of say it's nearly a free lamb coming into the system. Well, that's the way I look at it. Nearly, I know you yeah. spend a little bit more on the ewe rearing three lambs, but if I turned it out field with its mother, I'm quite likely to pick it up dead. Or having mm. to feed the ewe more again anyway. So it's where do you put the cost? Yes, that, that's yeah, that's a good uh, good answer. I think um, interesting. You know, it's interesting to know what other people might think about that. Uh, can we go on to the next slide, please, Leah? 
So we're breaking them down sort of piece by piece, like we thought that was the best way to show it. And obviously 2020, um, because you sold the lambs, the, you, the lamb losses were, you'd say, three to four weeks in, wasn't it, you said? Yeah. Yeah, so they'd already consumed a fair bit of the milk powder. Yeah. So it's the milk powder for more lambs. So how many lambs did you start off with, just interestingly enough? Uh, about similar. the same sort of number, I think it was about 115, 120 roughly. Okay, so that reflects that. So it's probably best to look at the 2018, 19 years really for a, a truer reflection of a. Yeah, that def uh, definitely gives a better reflection of the true cost and the system really. Okay, so um, yeah, so those are, yeah, those, I would have said, those are really good figures com in comparison with what other things I've seen. So you talked about your, your birth weight. So you've been measuring the birth weight. So what are they? Uh, triplets are about 3.7 kilos, roughly. Okay, and the, That's the like other this one? is with the main flock, this is. Yeah, yeah. And the doubles? Uh, they're 4.7, and the singles are 5.8. Okay, so they're quite, yeah, that's why it's solid, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, so talk us through this criteria of your uh, two and a half times birth weight and what you're achieving, uh, and uh, yeah, just take us through this sort of selection policy for when when you, how strict you are with the 35 days. Uh, we, we do wean every day of the week once we start weaning, um, and we weigh them, you know, as we want to wean them, and do check that they have actually reached minimum of two and a half times birth weight. Most of them hit three to four times birth weight at that point. Um, and anything that doesn't hit that criteria gets thrown back in the pen for three, four days to the, or maybe longer to get, hit that minimum of two and a half times birth weight. Okay, right. And some of them are sometimes more than that then? Oh yeah, some are considerably more than that two and a half. Okay, so what sort of ratio oh we've well i mean we've we've seen lambs up nearly 19 18 19 kilos we've been taking wow. out at 35 days old right so how many how many um tame lambs would you have at any one time uh there's probably a, up to about 70 is the max probably you know the main flock is where the majority of them come from and as they start to wean the the ewe lambs sort of kick in because it's just over a month and so that's when they tend to overlap so it's it's that's the peak and it soon drops down okay so if, if you have any issues with using milk powder and using the machine um or is it pretty fairly consistent it's pretty much consistent you get the odd lamb that you know obviously has another health issue there somewhere that checks it slightly um but there's very very few that we we keep back for extra time Questions? Yeah, just a few questions um, around milk powder and milk feeding, really. So, Adrian, how many kilograms of lamb milk do you think they're consuming? Obviously, we've got the costs on the screen, but do you know what it is in kilos? I think David actually worked it out earlier on, didn't you, David? <laughs> well, uh, to be honest, I did try to work it out, but it was a bit inconclusive because um, what you were telling me was. Uh, uh, yes, it probably was coming out about 19, 19 pounds 50, 19.50 a ton you were talking about, weren't you? Yeah. So it's working that back. Yeah, it, uh, the trouble is there's always a certain amount of milk powder that gets moved from one year to the next. Yeah. And it's, right. when I'm doing my benchmarking, it's remembering how much, if I have, I mean, it's roughly about half a bag of milk powder, roughly about 12 to 13 kilos. Yes, it was, it was running at about 10 kilos, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's that sort of ballpark. <laughs> and just touching on what David mentioned a minute ago, um, are you getting any problems with lambs passing on issues via the milk machine teat, orf in particular? We get very, very few instances of orf. Um, I mean, we, we don't see really see orf on the farm full stop. I mean, you may see one or two cases a year. So, uh, yeah, we don't see any problems with it as such. Okay. And do you get many problems with lambs blowing up? None at all on the machine. Because they they can drink little and often. They actually look more like a normal lamb. And you don't get them ballooning right out because they're not gorging themselves. So it's more of a, it's probably more of a natural process on the machine rather compared to feeding them with the bottle. 
And have you got any thoughts on giving them cow's milk? Uh, no, <laughs> never, never, never actually contemplated it really. I mean, um, there are dairy farms in the area, but it's nothing I've actually thought about. Okay, and then just a slight clarification, was it two and a half or three and a half times the birth weight? I'm pretty sure it's two and a half. Uh, it's what um, yeah. Volac recommend, basically. So. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I was just um, going to take you back then to the, your procedures for uh, cleaning of the of the machine. How does that work? And um, yeah, please explain. Uh, there's a mixing bowl in the machine that I clean out probably two or three times a week, just with hot water. And then I do a full pipe clean and the mixing bowl properly once a week with um, dairy chemicals to you know, flush the pipes out properly. I mean, it, it's worth mentioning when it, the, warmer, the weather gets warmer in April, I do tend to wash out more often because the environment's warmer. So then bacteria grows a bit quicker and you can end up with more problems. Yeah, OK. So how many teats are available for the lambs? Uh, we work on about 30 to a teat maximum. Um, and you sort of you can sort of gauge if everything's drinking and if you know if you do think there is a problem you can always add another teat the machine will take i think at least eight teats if but i mean i tend to uh put two teats on a single line so the milk moves through the line fast or more often and that keeps mm. the pipes cleaner the milk doesn't settle out in the pipes yes okay um so leading on now to the to the feed to the to the pellets yeah. Um, Leah, if you give us this next slide, that's better. Thank you. Um, how how does it work? You know, you obviously you have your strict um, weaning age, or, or as you say, you might keep them back a little bit depending on weight. Uh, what happens at weaning then? Do you do that um, suddenly, or how does yeah, it work? Yeah, suddenly weaned and put. I mean, there's always creep available from day one, basically, in front of them. They get weaned onto barley straw and creep. Okay, so how do you know? How do you, how, have you got any idea of how much they're intaking by then? Because uh, so, it's such a mixed age group, it's very, very hard to gauge that they're actually taking the, you know, what they recommend. You know, I think it's 200 grams a day, I think is what they recommend. But because it's such a mixed group of ages from, say, you know, three or four days old right up to the 35, it's impossible. Okay. Um, just having a thought, what uh, did you what what did you do prior to having the machine then? Did you have any other system? Uh, we had a, a bucket, you know, like a Shepherdess or a U2 uh, machine, and it was I think it was about four years ago. I decided well, we were doing that, and it's a case of you got to be a lot hotter on hygiene. One of those, so, you know, you need to clean out nearly daily, if not every other day, at the, at the you know the maximum. Because basically the milk's kept warm all the time and it doesn't change. Whereas with a computerized machine, it's mixing up half a litre at a time and that's changing all the time. You know, at the peak, we're putting through over a bag of powder a day. So obviously that's there's a lot of milk going through that machine and it keeps everything fresh. Hmm. And obviously before that, again, it was the good old bottle with tea. Okay. So have you upped your numbers since you've gone onto the machine system? Yeah. I mean, we were... Numbers? Yeah, we when we were back on a bucket on the bucket, we were probably doing about thirty or forty, and we would quite often say, "Oh, that triplet's good enough to rear three and send us field with three. Mm. And I mean, same with the ewe lambs. We were, we weren't taking any lambs away. It was only taking lambs, you know, that had problems. Yeah, sheep had problems in the shed. We would take lambs away at that point. So we're trying to keep numbers to a minimum, okay. and probably. Some lambs went to field that really should have stayed in, but because of the work side of it, the extra work, we sort of said, well, you give them the benefit of the doubt, nearly. <laughs> Looks like Mike's has some more questions coming in. Questions are flying in tonight, and we're on the subject of creep, so you're getting the creep questions now. Oh. Um, are your pet lambs creep feeder fed or trough fed? Uh, in a creep feeder. Well, you see, it's like you know, a normal sheep. Um, when you get out field, I've got one of those that you'll fit 20 or 30 down each, or 20 round it quite easily. And they're, they're 
it's ad lib, so it's always in front of them. And have you thought about selling your twin hog lambs straight off the hog and then you're not incurring milk powder and additional costs? Um, no, it's a simple question. Uh, I, we we look at the, especially since I've done the figures, I can see there is a margin in it that it's, you know, I just want to have that margin of someone else, really. And, you know, it comes back to the old thing, you know, time you get into a week old anyway, and then the time you go to market, it's sort of, you those that cost or that profit all of a sudden starts getting eaten into. Yeah. And then just a ballpark one, I think, for this, how much was your machine? I think it was about 2,600 or something roughly around then there i think i can look it up so okay the, the costing you gave me was 2850 yeah that's right i've just looked that up <laughs> yeah 2017 <laughs> yeah brilliant yeah, thank so. you <laughs> um yes so we'll, we'll go right into the to the creek now um so these these are the figures for the three three years um so I think you mentioned to us earlier that in 2019 you had a different regime as far as feeding with with yeah. and barley. Yeah, we um, started them off on creek creek pallets till they're about I think it was about a month old or a month after weaning. Then we moved them onto a barley and a protein pallet mix. So the same sort of balance as the start to finish pallet, but we were using our own barley on farm and just buying that extra just a bit of protein just to balance it. And you, you've indicated, are you going to go back to that for this year then, are you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, if I've got barley left, it's sort of, it's sort of, the, we, well, we grow a certain amount and we sell some and then I try and keep the right amount back, but if the cattle eat more, it disappears and it's, it's yeah, what's on hmm. farm really, basically. Okay, so have you had any issues, um, how, how do you get over the issues of any sort of, um, Flow, flow issues within the feeders when you're using a complete diet or a mix like that? There's, uh, no there's no problem at all. I mean, we we start with, yeah, you know, when we transition it, we started with um, like a 25% barley and protein pellet with a normal start to finish pellet and then gradually up that and reduce the start to finish. And the, the size is so steep anyway, it flows through so, you know, not just as easy as a pellet. Okay. Um, and the figures you gave us there, they, how did you cost in your own barley? Was that cost? I in? cost it in at the selling price. I could have could have got for it that year. I think okay. it was about 140 pound a ton. I think roughly. Okay, well that that's good. Yeah, I assumed you had. So um, we were right. That's good. That's very important to do so. Um, so working those figures back through, uh, they that comes to about 75 kilos a lamb. When I when I calculated yeah. with your with roughly. The, the feed costs you gave me on, on farm bench uh, yeah. from last year, um, which is about the same as what um, they're talking about in um, in the Harbour Adams survey as well, interestingly enough. Um, so how do you, yeah, how do you monitor what they're eating then and consuming? Uh, have you had any trouble with um, yeah, overconsumption and bloat with, with the pellet feeding after weaning? Well, no, none at all. I mean, it's a case of they're on ab lib from the start so there's no no issues build up anywhere it's they they don't seem to blow up or at all they just seem to they thrive on it really all right good good yeah so we're not, um, changing, we're not changing the diet at any point or if we do it's a gradual change so it's it yeah they just carry on as as normal really so if you if you um if you sudden wean um how much of a check do you get at weaning um, I, perfectly honest, I don't know. I don't tend to weigh, uh, weigh them again till uh, they're about eight weeks old. So I mean, at that point, they have actually continued to grow, and you know, I don't go in a week after and weigh them because usually we've, we're too busy doing everything else. Okay. So are they um, are the wean um, yeah are the wean lambs in the same shed then? How does it work? Yeah, they're basically the next pen. Basically, this they come from the the milk pen into the next available large sheep pen, as you can see in the photo. So you know, never any problem with that. At all. No, no, they're sort of very simple and try not to cart them around too much because it all takes time and effort. Yes. Um, so 
obviously you're, you're quite tight and, and yeah, it, it, you're very tight on these costs. Um, so how does that, um, do you think any costs could be reduced even further? Because obviously these are the two biggest costs on the system so far. Uh, like I think I said earlier on, I have toyed with other milk powders that are cheaper. Um, but I mean, without buying a second machine, it'd be very hard to compare the two. And seeing it, uh, it's working, I'm seeing good growth, growth rates. I'm very sort of loath to change for, a, I won't say a less, lesser product, but a cheaper product, you know, because usually they're cheaper for a reason. Um, whereas the concentrate, um, I'm always open up to new ideas and trying different things with the concentrate, you know, like moving to the barley, which obviously brought the cost down a little bit. I mean, the barley cost always sort of reflects slightly in the creep cost anyway. You know, the barley's higher, the creep cost will be higher. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, yes, that's true. Um, so it's interesting you're going to go back to that anyway. So can we have the next um, cost element, please, Leah? Uh, I've, this is yeah, one thing I was yeah, going to, obviously, it's important to have straw. So how does it work with straw to feed and, and bedding? So this is your this is all the straw that's costed in, is it? Yeah, that's all the straw. Um, it's very much we don't actually rebed them up after the first bedding because we have got straw in racks and the amount they pull out is enough to keep them bedded. So it's we go yeah, literally top the straw racks up every day and they look after themselves now, from that point of view. So on the bedding itself, does it, does it get especially wet run by the machine or is that all over? Oh, when the when the young lambs, um, it's very wet next right next to the machine, and I mean the whole bed does get wet because just the volume of milk they're drinking, you know, within the the group. Uh, but I mean we do we do actually pull the straw out and then we actually put it into the cattle sheds to bed the cattle up with afterwards. So it's, you know because it's we try and keep them as dry as possible so the the straw isn't wet wet so it's a good bedding for the cattle. Yes. Is this, so is this your own straw, your own on farm uh, straw? Yeah, usually your own straw. I mean, there's, there's a bit of other straw coming in, but a lot of it is the barley straw tends to be your own. Okay. So how often do you, um, yeah, fill up the racks or is it just as and when? The racks with the wean lambs daily. Um, and like I say with the, the young lambs on the machine, they're bedded up probably every day, just a little bit. Just to make sure they're nice and dry and and happy. Yeah. So how much how much would you say they eat? They have sort of given any indication. Very hard to judge how much they eat, really, because the amount they actually waste on the floor, really. Yeah. So that's... This, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I presume there was more electricity last year. That was because of the the difference in the lamb numbers. Yeah, yeah, it would have been, yeah. Okay. Um, I just, yeah, just interesting about the electric. I haven't sort of pre-asked you this question, but um, uh, have you sort of any backup, you know, what happens if the power goes and um, obviously your machine goes? And... We've got the uh, facility to plug in a tractor generator okay. that runs the whole farm and the farmhouse, so it's there is that option if need be. Okay. That's good. That's important. But not because... not bought specifically for this like this. It was bought for more if if the electric does go off. I've got no heating in my house without electric. <laughs> question. Yeah, we just got before you move on. We've just got a few more nutrition related questions coming through. Um, what's the protein level you're aiming for in your barley mix, Adrian? I can't honestly remember. It's basically be similar to the um, start to finish pellet. Uh, yeah, start to finish pellets. I mean, I spoke to my feed rep and he tailored it to my barley and just went on from there, really. And have you fed whole barley as opposed to rolled? Um, and what do you use to roll it? Uh, we've got a roller mill on farm. Um, and I mean, we feed whole barley or whole oats to the sheep uh, before lambing, but yeah, for the lambs, he actually rolled it. Okay, and are you adding any minerals in? Uh, the protein pellet or the um, start to finish pellets are all mineralized anyway, so I didn't see the point in double hitting them really. Okay, and do you feed any hay or just straw and 
whatever the answer is to that, why? Just straw. Um, and uh, it's what I was recommended to do. And you know, we tried it and we, we've seen good, you know, obviously seen good growth, growth rates from it. Um, and it's, so it comes back to baby calves. That they say feed straw to them because it slows the gut transition down you know, with the fiber. So obviously if the gut's going slower, you get more nutrients out of the creep. Well, that's my, my theory anyway. <laughs> And we've spoken a little bit about off um, as far as the milk teats go, but further on from milk teats, are you having issues with off amongst your pet lambs on a whole or um, are they all right generally? They're generally right. I mean, like I said, we only see probably two or three cases on the farm, you know, in all the lambs. So it's very, very low instances. So nothing to worry about, really. Brilliant, thank you. I do see it tends to be in the very young lambs on the teats after that it disappears okay thank you very much thanks um yeah next next bit leah i think we're going right into depreciation this is the one that interests me depreciation is always a bit of a sticky subject um can you talk us through what you've included in these figures adrian yeah depreciation is the lamb feeder you know, the milk feeder and the uh, creek feeder, basically. Okay. Um, obviously, the prices have changed depending on how many lambs have gone through that system in the year. I literally split the cost of the two two things in ten over ten years, and then divided by the number of lambs I've reared. So, how your your machine? You've had it for seven years. No, you bought it in two thousand and seventeen. So it's four yeah. years. You're into your fifth year now. Um, so yeah going okay as far as efficiency and everything yeah brilliant i mean i haven't started up again, again this year yet but i mean there's no reason why i shouldn't just plug in and where it goes really okay. i mean the the parts are readily available they're sort of interchangeable with a lot of the calf machines so yeah there's not like it's niche parts yeah okay um so yeah, ten years is that a fair, fair estimate of how long it'll last? Do you think it'll last longer? Or oh, I'm hoping it'll last a lot longer than that. But I mean, it's if you can write something off over ten years, you know, that's brilliant. You know, it should should go on for a lot longer than that. You know, I'm hoping to get fifteen, maybe twenty years out of it. Okay. It's a fairly reasonably simple machine. Right. Um, so the question I, I think I asked you when I first saw these figures was um, you haven't put any depreciation in for any other infrastructure for a shed or anything like that. So yeah, why was that? And yeah, what happens with the shed? Um, the sheep, well, the lambs are kept in the sheep shed. So I mean, I've attributed the cost of the shed to the sheep basically. It's, it's not getting used for anything else for the rest of that time of year. So it's... I mean, yes, you could argue that a portion of that cost should be put to the tame lambs, but you can argue a lot of things, can't you? <laughs> yes, well, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the um, but you, you do you, you I think you use that shed for other things as well as the lambing, don't you? Yeah, yeah, it gets used as uh, machinery storage during the summer, and it's where we sell our Christmas trees out from in December. We turn the whole shed into a big display area and. Yeah, wash it out nicely, which is good because it means we wash it out sort of the end of um, or mid October, sorry, mid November, the latest, and that's six weeks with nothing in at all before the sheep come in in early January. Okay, yes, and I would like to point out, yes, we do, uh, we do include your um, the, the shed in for your depreciation for and your farm bench figures, don't we? Mm, yes. Allocate accordingly uh, according to what you've just told us. Yeah, uh, because you know, some people might. You know, might say, well, it's okay. it's it's fine for you because you've got that shed there and you're making good use yeah. of it. Um, if you had to um, uh, erect something or provide a shed which wasn't there already, would would this would this be viable at all? Um, I mean, if you you put up a reasonable shelter for five thousand pound, probably you know, even if it's a poly tunnel, I and mean, that would only you know, you say that's twice the cost of the depreciation that's on the fit screen there now. So you're talking, what, six pounds? 
So there is still room to put that shed up and have have a margin. Yes, that's that's true. Um, I just wanted to also ask you when when we're not we're thinking about shed space enough space for them. Um, have you got a figure of that? Yeah, how a lowering area area per lamb space in there and and about the vent second is probably is this sort of ventilation aspects of the shed i it's a it was a four-year-old shed so it's nice and airy we've got um an open ridge or open protective ridge in the shed so ventilation isn't a problem um size wise they i mean as you see from the picture they're in a 30 by 25 foot pen to start off with and as they get bigger or more numbers come we can open up the next pen to it so double the area so we always make sure they've got plenty of room to loaf around and run around. Okay. Um, do you um, did you make any special adaptions then for specifically for the lambs? Uh, the only thing we do is put up hurdles along the front so they can get out through the feed barriers. That's basically the only thing. And what about ventilation on the sides then? Um, it's uh, normal space boarding, uh, but we have got gale breakers on the end of the shed, so. If it does get hot and stuffy, we can open those up okay. just a little bit more air through airflow through. Yes. All right. Um, but there's no other infrastructure needed, really. No. That's it. Okay. Um, right. Can we have the next um, little portion, please, Leah? No other questions have come up for now. There it is. So this is tiny because I. I this was a question I asked you, and I said, well, you haven't got any vet med figures for 2018-19, only a tiny amount in 2020. Um, is, how, how so, is my question. Yeah, uh, 2020 came down to, we were trying to treat the um, pneumonia we had in the shed. So oh. was a certain amount got attributed to that. Um, and the other years, they don't basically don't get anything at all. They don't get any, um, Click or Crovec or any fly porons. Um, they may get a little bit of ovivac that's left from the main flock, you know, depending on pack size, but we don't, we wouldn't routine cover everything twice in the shed. They they basically don't get any vet med at all. Okay. So no other interventions really? No. Hmm. No, so, you know, we, we, we haven't seen a problem with it, so we don't spend the money on it. No. Okay, that's that's good. So actually, that that would just sort of indicate a pretty high level of detail, um, attention to detail once you're actually in the system. Yeah, I mean, like OVVAC, I mean, most of it is soil-borne diseases, and they're not going outside, so they don't get that challenge. Yeah. And what about um, what we haven't mentioned is about hygiene and sort of yeah, personal hygiene for for those who are working in the system. Um, it's basically only me, my dad, and my wife that actually would deal with them at all. And yeah, we don't, we don't really go off farm, so especially that time of year, so <laughs> there's very little risk of cross infection. Okay, so I, I think you said you had a couple of part time employees, so they don't get involved with that side then? Not not generally, no. I mean, they tend to be more of the cattle and they will pop in at times and clean pens out, but not actually deal with the tame lambs as such. Yeah, so how critical do you think um, um, hygiene is on the system to make it work? When the lambs are young, critical. Yeah, as, as you can see from the 2020s figures, I mean, there was a mm -hmm. slip up and it, yeah, really not the system. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's keeping them clean and dry is the key thing. Yeah. Okay, that's good. No, excellent. Uh, so, okay, for the next uh, chunk, please, Leah. So this is the labour. Um, so can you talk us through these these figures? How you've arrived at these figures? So this is per lamb, tame lamb reared. Yeah, um, basically I've cost in half an hour a lamb basically in 2018-2019, um, which I think David said it came in like 62 and a half hours a year or something close to that, wasn't it, David? I guess it was for yeah, for that for the lamb 25. So that's um, yeah. Two thirds of the year, or three quarters of them. Yeah. Uh, and the other two were 58 hours for 2019 and 54 hours for 2018. So um, that was a question I wanted to ask. I'm sure other people might be thinking it is, is yes, it's it's finding that time 
because that is when you start looking at it total hours, that's quite a chunk of time that you've got to put to that system. Yeah, I mean, it's probably an overestimation. And I mean, we if we spend half an hour a day on them when they're young, as in the whole group, you know, you're talking 60 odd lambs in half an hour, it soon breaks it down to very little amount of time per lamb. So it's, and yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's probably an overestimation of the time we spent with them. And it's yeah. also the time, you know, right through the system, you know, putting creep into them as well and things like that. But it's the little bit every day that, okay. you know, maybe yes. a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, simple maths indicates if that's half half an hour, that's 15, you've put yourself at 15 pounds a lamb, 50 pounds an hour for that labour. Yeah, I mean, it's trying to be realistic. I mean, on paper, I well, I don't pay myself that in in real terms, but it's it's got to have a realistic figure that if you're employing someone and, you know, time you take into account the holidays, sick pay, everything, you soon get to 15 pounds an hour. Absolutely. Um, Yes, but that it, it it is a fair amount of time because this is you know, right at your peak busy time, and it's not only the lambing; it's it's all the spring work on the farm as well. Yeah. So how do you? Yeah. So what's what's what what takes the most most amount of time? In the workload for for on on the tame lambs. I mean, um, there's probably not one thing. I mean, it, so training them takes probably three or four minutes you know you go there two or three times and they they you know for a minute at a time and they soon learn how to suck so it's it's just lots of little increments of time so there's no real big chunk in one hit that you know saps all the time out of your day so how how often do they get checked then how does that work how did you make sure that you are keeping an eye on it between yourselves? I mean, the machine's got a counter on it, so every time it mixes it, the counter goes up by one. So I keep a record of that. I check that twice a day. You know, when I walk through the shed, I just look at it, write it down on a card, so then I know it. Yeah, you know, by looking from one day to the next, I can more or less guarantee within two or three portions where it should be. And if there's a discrepancy in that, I know that there's a problem there somewhere. I need to investigate further. Okay, so it's chiefly your responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's no chance of anything being missed then, you know, if you've got two or three of you responsible for lambs. Yeah, I mean, it is pretty much me responsible for looking after the machine and, you know, making sure everything's right. And it's like the same with when the lambs come into the training pen. We always write down on a card the tag number, and the day it came in, so then we know which ones we need to check really well to make sure they're drinking. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Looks like we've got some more questions coming in. We've got a lot. I'm not sure we're going to get through them all tonight. But you just meant you just mentioned the machine again, so you're going to get some more questions on that. Um, are there any maintenance costs, um, parts that wear out, so wear and tear on your automatic feeder? Uh, basically, anything I spend on it is new pipes and new teats, which it come in at about about twenty five pounds a year, roughly. Yeah, you, know, you could probably could reuse the pipes, but I try to. I think was for the amount of money, it's it's just well put a new one. Okay, and are you servicing it each year? There isn't really much to service on it. I mean, it's it's cleaned out really well at the end of the season. Um, yeah, you know, put away clean and and then it's just literally fired up and where you go. Okay, how long does it take you to wash it? It's about five minutes. Okay. Yeah, so it's like I think it's a ninety second cycle that I run through so two or three times. Okay. And how many pet lambs do you have to have sat in a pen before you decide to start it up? About two, because it's <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's it's so nice when the lamb is shed that you know, if you have got something you want to top up, there's always warm milk there, the right right uh consistency that you can just go and grab a bottle top one up you know so easily and that's like one of the added bonuses as such okay yeah. and then just a quick one because i think you mentioned it earlier um were you using ovi back p at all uh yeah it would have been p yeah but it's literally if i got a little bit left from the main flock i'll, I'll use it on them if not i won't bother 
is if you're just using up what's on farm. But I don't actively buy every rack to cover them. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. I'll let you carry on. Thanks. That does uh, neatly put us uh, that question about the, the cost onto the last section of the cost here, which uh, Leah will put up. Uh, and that is, yeah, that is your sundry cost, isn't it? Yeah. Stop and that hand. takes into account sort of um, spray markers. Um, yeah, they all see the, the big pieces of the machine. I mean, I, again, I've probably over overestimated on a pound of lamb because that then comes in at nearly £100 a year. But is trying to be, I might rather put a bigger figure in to give me a realistic thing or a realistic idea at the bottom rather than kid myself saying it's only 20p a lamb. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if we put uh, overlay the last bit, Leah, which is the actual uh, income, showing the income. So you can see yeah, on the graphical form how that it has provided you with a margin on each in each year. Yeah. Um, and that's with the 2020. Prices. So these lambs were sold. Well, actually, we're going to come to days to slaughter in a moment, aren't we? Um, going back on the advantage of this system, then um, I guess it's quite a hard thing. You know, it's something we've discussed this, haven't we? How, how do we? Um, how can we guesstimate a cost of, of the effect on, on the flock management advantages of this? Um, oh, it's probably very hard to. I mean, well, you probably could sit down and work it out at length, but yeah, it's the the bonus to that, the condition of the U going forward into next season, really. It's, and I mean, don't like talking about losses, but if you do turn a lamb out on a U that is borderline going to rear two lambs or three lambs, you're more likely to pick them up dead. So it's trying to stop those losses, you know. So it's, it's sort of the bigger picture around it is if I break even, brilliant. But even if I make a, you know, I said earlier on, if even I make a slight loss, the bonuses to the rest of the flock or the bigger picture, you know, mitigates that loss. So it's improved, in your eyes, it's improved you health and it's improved oh, yeah. survivability and, and, and welfare yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. That, that's, that's really good. Really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm really interested. You sort of made made the comments before because some people would decide to turn their lambs out to wean uh, after weaning, or shortly afterwards. But I suppose it depends on how how quickly they go to slaughter. Is that the reason why you don't do that, really? Yeah, that's one of the reasons. I mean, it's. I mean, it's also yeah you know, part of that, and it's also another hundred lambs out grazing. That I mean, certainly in 2018 when we had the drought, I was so glad I had those lambs in because. We got down to I think we had like three or four days of grass ahead of ourselves before it rained, so we were sort of cutting it fairly fine. So to have those hundred lambs in shed meant there was, you know, if we had those out field, we probably wouldn't have had that grass. They were eating yeah. that already. So um, I was talking to another producer a few weeks ago about about this, and he has a machine, and um, he says he'd put his lambs out on um, his, his his tame lambs out on um, aftermath grass after first cut silage. So have you not thought about you doing that as an option? Uh, I mean, that's sort of mid for us would probably be mid to early June before they went out. So I mean, at that point, they're already finishing. We're already finishing lambs at that point. So it's sort of what? Where do you do the cut off to turn them out? You know, they are they're thriving on the system, and you turn them out, and then all of a sudden you you, you need to over vac them. You need to uh, cover them for flies, um, might get feet problems, worm problems, you know, there's a lot of environmental challenges at that point then. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it'd be a good idea to go to the next slide, Leah. So um, Adrian provided us with, um, no, the one after that, uh, with the um, data for slaughter age and carcass weight. Now, it gave us for the three years average, and this is for RAM compare, so there's a difference in um, the number of tame lambs sold because it's just it's just the the uh, the amount lambs used in in that scheme, isn't it? Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. because we record everything from birth all the way through, it was easier to pull this data out and and you know actually have have this data to you easier. 
Yes, so this was um, the same round compared for providing it as well, yes. actually. <laughs> so I'd say thank you very much to, to so, my colleagues. So this, this data comes from the breeding flock as opposed to the ewe lambs, so they're just excluded from this? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, so 180 lambs against the natural lamb, so 1592. Um, so the average days to slaughter for the Thames is 138 days, and natural weight average age 189. So significant difference there. And also their average carcass weight was half kilo heavier. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I was surprised how many, how big a difference it was in the days of slaughter. In actual fact, when I got this data through, is yeah. you know a, a nice surprise as such. Yes. And uh, they've also provided a nice, uh, that in graphical form to sort of show the spread. So if you show us that, Leah. So this is all the, this is the, if you try to get your head around this, is days to slaughter on the bottom axis and on the side axis is a carcass weight in kilos. So you see the spread of all the lamb, all, all, all the um, uh, lamb sold in that year. This is two 2020 figures. Um, and the, the artificial lambs are the ones in orange, so they're more on the left-hand side, so earlier to slaughter, as indicated. There are some outliers, just a few outliers. So why why would that have been then? Uh, that might be ones that had, you know, been in pneumonia and recovered, but obviously had that growth check. Um, mm. But you know, they got there eventually. You know, it's as you can see. I mean, the carcass weights are you know very good, or else they were. Well, yeah, they obviously had that check, and also because we run so many different breeds, there is a slight uh, breed discrepancy as well sometimes. Okay, um, can you talk us through again? I think you, you described it earlier, but it was quite a long time ago. Is how do you how do you select for slaughter? Um, yes, what's your criteria and how often? Uh, um, we run them all across the scales every two weeks from well eight weeks old onwards, but usually from ten weeks onwards there's stuff ready ready to go to slaughter. I mean, I pick on. I think it's like 38 kilos at the early season, you know, trying to hit that higher price. And then as the season goes through, it gradually goes back to about 43 kilos. Uh, though the tame lambs, I will pick slightly lighter because they tend to be a little bit fatter than the you know, grass fed ones. Mm. Yes, yeah, really interesting. That is. Um... Just one more comment from me before I hand it back to, to Leah and Emma for any final questions from the audience. Uh, you do seem to have a wealth of data and systems that you use for recording data. Um, obviously, you, yeah, you, 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 you find great value in, in using these figures. Uh, can you give us any indication of other recording, what recording systems you do use? Uh, we use the SheWell system um so i've got a handheld that i take out in the lamb shed and uh on the scales we've got a race reader as well that links to it as long as as well as the electronic scales so it records all the weights automatically so you weigh sort of 300 plus hour lambs an hour so it's trying to keep that labor cost down by using technology really and okay. trying to make it simple that anybody can use <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got no further questions, actually, Leah. So if you want to come back to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Emma, do you have any more questions you'd like to ask for a couple of minutes? Yes, I do. And please tell me when to stop, Leah, because I've probably got more questions than you can than you've got time for. Um, Adrian, do you find you have resistance from some buyers when selling how, house finished lambs later in the season from July onwards? Uh, they all go dead weight anyway, so um, and I don't see any difference in the price per kilo, and they are marked separately to say they aren't grass fed because they do specify that on their delivery forms. But I mean, by that time, most of them have gone. So I mean, okay. we did have one back for our own eating. Oh, that was sort of fairly late on. He broke his shoulder, and he was quite happy and diffused and we end up having his own freezer and he, he ate very well. Okay and a couple of questions about um, castrations so whether you're castrating and tailing lambs and if you are what impact do you think that's having on the lambs? Uh, they're done when I tag them you know at eight well 12 to 24 hours old 
and see very, very little impact at all. You know, the growth rates we see all the way through the system, I think because it's done when they're so young, it doesn't have a check on them. Okay. And are your tame lambs grading similarly, similarly, I can't say it, to your natural ones? Uh, probably just a fraction fatter as a rule. The, yeah, just because of the diet they're on. Um, uh, that's why I will pick slightly lighter. But then the carcass weights aren't reflecting that really. And do you have any real health costs at all? I know we spoke about your vet and med was quite small within you percentage but what on the, on the subject of health what kind of are you spending money on on the same lambs basically nothing you know they, they don't get fly treatment they don't get ovivac um they don't get wormers so there's very little cost on that at all okay and how are your costs looking for 2021 have your has your milk powder and creep gone up in price um i think the milk powder is coming about the same creep i haven't looked at yet no, but no doubt it has gone up so i mean there is going to be a, a squeeze on the margin because of that okay but, yeah there, hopefully and you know go back to 18 and 19 there is that 20 pound margin or plus so there is there is room there to still make a profit on them obviously depending on the selling price at the end of the year yeah <laughs> <laughs> and what and, uh, is oh how many more have you got i'll, I'll have none left I'll have this as my last one. Is that all right? That's fine, yeah. What is the percentage mix of your iodine and surgical spirit, please? Well, that's, I meant to look that up and I've completely forgot. It's written on the side of the surgical spirit bowl and I haven't actually got it out because we haven't started lambing yet. But I think... Is it Miranda, says, added? Miranda says it's two and a half. Oh, two and a half, right? <laughs> <laughs> Helps having the vet on the line with yeah. 25 mil in a litre of iodine. That's it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Miranda. <laughs> if if there are any final questions, um, we can always send answers via email. So please um, keep them coming in and we'll come back to you. Um, we're going to have to wrap up shortly. So I'm just going to signpost to some final resources. Um, bear with me just a second. Okay, so um, I thought it would be useful to signpost to HDB's Cattle and Sheep Weekly. But Adrian, he knows that he makes a margin because his cost of production per lamb is less than the market price. Um, if you are looking at your cost of production for your lambs and, and wanting to know what that needs to be, um, AHDB have five year averages for both um, dead weight and live weight um, for old season lamb, the new season lamb whatever the season is throwing at the time. Um, so you can have a look on our website or please get in touch with us if you can't find that information and we can look back for you and dig that out. Um, we've got some other resources that might be of use as, as well. And these will all be sent to you in your follow-up email. So you'll have uh, links to all of these. First up, we've got the Medicine Hub. Um, this is for recording antibiotic uses in, in sheep and cattle electronically. We've got web pages on colostrum management for lambs um, and the colostrum is gold web page on feeding colostrum to calves, lambs and piglets. Um, and this has advice as well on um, uh, how to defrost colostrum if you've frozen it that we spoke about earlier. Um, there's a webinar you might be interested in and that was the rewards of maximising newborn survival. This was only recorded last month, I believe, so it's quite recent. Um, and we spoke a little bit about Ram Compare and, and they've done a video as well with five things they've learned with Adrian at Dupath Farm. Um, next up we've got um, a manual um, you can access this virtually on the website or you can get in contact with us or order um, a, a physical version for free um, that you can have at home and that's about assessing the business for better returns um, cattle and sheep weekly that, that I mentioned a, a moment ago you'll have to sign up for a keeping in touch form for that which again is linked in the email and then last but not least is farm bench um, which is HDB's benchmarking tool so um, thank you everyone for dialing in this evening. Thank you very much to Adrian, um, to David and to Emma for helping out as well. Um, if you're interested, oh, my slides. If you're interested in um, the next webinar, that, that's happening tomorrow evening. And again, that's a strategic farm event. Um, and that is all about the journey to rotational grazing and, and what's next with our strategic farmer, um, Stephen Lawson. Um, so yep. Yeah, on tomorrow 7pm and you can uh, join by logging in 
as you have done for this evening via the website. Um, if you would like to view it, but you're busy tomorrow, then please feel free to register and you'll be sent the link um, a couple of days after to watch back in your own time. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us this evening um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>